So you get the PO, you make the parts, you do all your inspection to the drawing, and you send them out. Then you get the phone call you hope you're never gonna get, and that's because the customer is rejecting them. But when you go and look at the drawing, your parts are correct. What's up guys? Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool, back here again for Practical Machinist. And today on Shop Talk, we're gonna be going through the situation that a poster had on the Practical Machinist forums where a customer doesn't seem to be following their own tolerances. But before we do, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so as promised today, we're gonna to be heading back into the Practical Machinist forums to tackle a question posed by a forum member on the shop management and ownership sub forum. So to summarize their post, they have a bit of a situation on their hands and it kind of goes as follows. This person seems to own or run a machine shop and they have these two customers that are existing customers. So these are not new customers, these are customers that they've done. It sounded like based on the way they phrased it, quite a bit of work for over the years. Um, you know, they're not some new guy off the street. They have a working relationship. They've worked parts up for them. And the way these two customers have their deal set up with this company is that when this poster is doing a production run, what they'll do is do a sample or a couple of samples of the part, do their own QA in house, and then send them out to the customer for their own QA for approval before they do the rest of the run. This is pretty bog standard. Um, we do this a lot with some of our customers here. It's a nice thing, not only for them to make sure they're getting the part they want, but it's nice for us. It really helps everybody because if there's an issue with the part, I'd rather know after three parts have been done rather than one 200 have been done. And then either I have to figure out if I can rework them or if I have to remake them. It's time, it's money, it's effort. And sometimes it has nothing to do with what we've done here. You know, maybe we make the part completely to the drawing, they get the parts and they realize, oh no, someone here messed up, this doesn't fit, we have to change it. So from both sides of the equation, this is pretty normal and, you know, I advise this situation if you can ever get it. You know, it does eat up a little more time because you have to wait for them to do their QA and you may have a machine sitting for a minute, but when possible, it's, it's actually a good situation. So the first customer that this poster was talking about, the poster said that they made these parts, whatever they were, and they had some threads in them. And when the customer ordered these parts, they sent along go, no go thread gauges to check these parts. For those of you guys who don't know, maybe you haven't used go and no go gauges before, maybe you're new to the trade. Go no go gauges, you can get them for a variety of different things, for threads, for bores, for uh, features. You know, sometimes they're custom and you make them specifically for a part. Sometimes they're kind of off the shelf things like, you know, uh, thread gauge to check a 1024 thread. So what no, go and no go gauges do is a go gauge should thread into the part to a specified depth and should be nice and tight, you know, tight within reason. This means that the threads are big enough and there is enough thread engagement that it can go in, but it's not getting stuck. So in other words, if you try to put a go gauge in and it doesn't go, that part's no good. Conversely, the no go gauge is usually above the tolerance of the part. So the no go gauge is supposed to not go beyond, depending on which kind of thread you're doing, one turn, two turns. Sometimes they're a little tapered. And that's to show that the threads are not too sloppy. If a no-go gauge goes in, that, I mean, it depends on the thread class. There's a lot more that goes into this, but to simplify, if the no-go gauge goes in, that means that the threads are too sloppy. And if you're dealing with scenarios where, you know, maybe that part that threads in has a lot of weight on it, it may not be strong enough. You may strip the threads or it needs to hold a certain amount of torque. Um, basically that's the way it goes. And this is generally accepted as long as you're using the right class of thread gauge and you know a thread gauge, go gauge, uh, go no go gauge, that is 
official. You know, it's been calibrated. You're not just making one up and hoping for the best. This is pretty generally accepted practice in order to check threads. Well, the problem is this guy made the parts. Go gauge goes in, no go gauge doesn't go in. You know, there you go, away you go. Parts should be good, right? Well, they send the parts off to the customer and the customer rejects them. So he calls and he says, you know, hey, listen, what's, what's going on? Why are these parts getting rejected? And the engineer at this company said, well, you know, yeah, the go gauge goes in and the no go gauge goes in, but the threads are too sloppy. They're too loose. And he says, well, the no go gauge doesn't go in. And the guy says, yeah, well, actually, I had one of our guys cut the part in half through the threads. I don't know if it was on EDM or on a bandsaw. We looked at the threads and there's no crest on the threads properly. You know, it should have a good crest on them. And the person who posted said, well, yeah, listen, we used a form tap for this versus a cut tap. So the threads look a little different, but they still have the same function. You know, it's, this is generally accepted manufacturing practice. The go gauge goes in, no go gauge doesn't go in. You're still getting the thread engagement you're supposed to have. And this engineer was not having it. You know, they just for whatever reason weren't having it. And when the poster, you know, said, well, what do we do about this? Should we get some new thread gauges? Should we um, use a cut tap instead of a form tap? The engineer said, well, actually we want it based on feel. It should feel like this. And for any of you guys who have been in a scenario like this, you know, this is the beginning of the end. The second, when it comes to any kind of QA or inspection and you're basing it on subjective opinion, rather than an objective method of measuring, you're already done. You're done. There's a reason why we have, you know, surface roughness comparators or surface finish gauges or all this kind of stuff, because I can say, yeah, that looks like a good finish. And the customer says, no, it's not a good finish. You need an objective way to measure it. And if that measure is feel, well, then the customer can say, well, you know, it doesn't feel right. Well, feel is not an objective measure. So this is a huge problem. The second situation that this poster described, this is actually a different customer, but same scenario. This is the same shop that's dealing with this. They had these little pins made. And the person who described this said that the drawing didn't have any real tight tolerances on it. They didn't specify what those tolerances were, but let's say plus minus 5 thou. So these little, th uh, little pins that have plus minus 5 thou on them pretty easy, no problem. They're quoted fairly low. You know, it sounded like it was a pretty cheap part. They make the parts, they measure them to the drawing, matches the tolerance, everything's good, sends them out. Well, the engineer there says, hey, listen, no, these are rejected. Again, the poster says, why are these parts rejected? The engineer says, well, actually, these are supposed to have a three micron straightness and roundness tolerance on them. Poster said, Okay, that's not on the drawing. The engineer said, yep, correct, that's not on the drawing. So he said, okay, if you wanna revise the drawing, I'll requote it and I can make them. Because as you guys know, this would require a requote because a part with a 5,000 tolerance is way cheaper and easier to make than a part with a three micron tolerance. It's, it's apples to oranges, really. One, you're asking for you know a pretty generic, easy part. You could even use material stock for some stuff like that. The other, you're asking for something extremely precision. So, you know, he says, hey, change the drawing, I'll requote. And for whatever reason at this company, the engineer was not able to change the drawing. Uh, this isn't terribly uncommon. It's not common per se, but it's not rare. You know, in some of these big companies, drawings may be very, very strictly controlled. So for whatever reason, the guy asking you to make the parts may not have the authority to make changes to that drawing because it may need to go through 15 levels of approval before it gets changed. And in some circumstances, you know, if you're dealing with a big multinational, while it's possible, in effect, it may essentially be impossible for all intents and purposes. So he was kind of, the person who came on and posted this was saying, you know, I, I'm at a standstill. I don't know what to do with this customer. I made the parts of their drawing. They rejected them agreed that the parts were to the drawing and now want something they didn't ask for. And as another person who replied on this thread put it, and I thought this was exactly the way I would have put it, you gave the customer what they want, what they asked for, but not what they wanted. 
That's a big thing. You gave the customer what they asked for, but not what they wanted. That's something we're all gonna deal with a lot. I'll tell you that right now if you're getting into machining. This is not rare. To kind of cover what my opinion is on this and what I would do, firstly, I think a big part of what the person who came on who asked this is dealing with is a lack of education on machining processes by the engineers. It's almost a bit of a meme at this point, you know, the everybody hates engineers because they don't understand machining, but I don't think this is really warranted in this situation. I, I don't think anybody should have bad feelings or ill will towards engineers. You have to understand that they have one set of expertise, you have another. Well, they all like to say, yeah, I could have been an engineer. The fact is there's a lot that they can do, you know, structural analyses, um, design, all this kind of stuff that they can do, that they can be very, very good at, but they don't have the background in machining to understand machining processes. Some engineers do, and that's great, but you know, what did they get in some engineering classes? Do they get, or uh, you know, courses? Do they get four weeks in a machine shop? Do they get shown a video? You have to understand that some of these people who are in engineering roles or asking for quotes may not have as much experience as you in machining. That's why they're coming to you. So to kind of put it in perspective, one of my customers is, and they're actually one of my biggest customers, they're a huge, huge company. And they're having a lot of the same issues with staffing that we're having in the machining industry. They don't have a pool of qualified engineers just sitting out there waiting to be hired the same way we used to have a pool of qualified machinists out there waiting to be hired. So much like we're having to go through and train people up from zero, as opposed to hiring highly qualified people, this company is doing the same thing. Instead of hiring engineers here, while they have engineers here to supervise and train, some of their engineers tend to be fresh grads or people without a ton of practical experience and they're training them up. I think this is great. You know, you have to, manufacturing isn't just on the floor. You need people to request quotes too. It makes sense, I think it's great. That said, a lot of these junior engineers or you know, associate engineers may not have a whole lot of practical machining experience or manufacturing experience. They may not even have a lot of practical engineering experience. They're new. You know, I get a lot of drawings that have features that just aren't really practical for manufacturing. You know, sharp internal corners at the bottom of holes, or I'll get a drawing with, you know, two tenths tolerance on everything because, you know, more tolerances, more accurate, right? And then they wonder why it's so expensive. My first step when I have these kind of scenarios come to me is to call them and go through the drawings with them and hopefully educate them. So if I get a drawing that, you know, has stupid tolerances on it, I'll call them and say, hey, listen, what's actually critical on this? What does this do? And then as we go through it, we may find, well, do you know what? Yeah, we do actually need that tolerance on one feature or two features, but the outside, this thing gets screwed down to a plate. It can be plus minus a 16th for all everybody cares. And by educating them as we go through, that kind of helps them because they're gonna save money and me, I'm gonna save headaches. We build a working relationship. I learn to trust them, they learn to trust me. Everything works out well. That said, the poster who came on with this, you know, when they're dealing with a roll tap issue, that's where I first think that's a, or a form tap issue, that's an education thing. That said, when they're dealing with someone who it sounds like they've tried to educate them, if you've tried to take that step, realistically, there's not a whole lot you can do. If someone's asking for something based on feel or you know, asking for a nice finish and rejecting on a finish or whatever it may be, these subjective opinions, you've tried to educate them, you've tried to you know, codify what they're asking for and they're just not having it. If I was in that scenario at the end of the day, you, know, you don't wanna go over somebody's head, but it sounds like he's had a long working relationship with this company, I'd be going over their head at this point and saying, you know, listen, we've had a long working relationship. I would love to provide these parts for you. The engineer asking for them is asking for something that I can't do. Can we try to figure this out? Can we codify it? You know, you may need to go over their head and the person whose head you're going over never likes that. But if it's that or killing the relationship entirely, maybe they need to get their head checked a little bit, not their head checked. They need to get their ego checked by their manager or by their supervisor. And then they can see maybe they were being a little pig headed. If that doesn't work or you're not willing to do that, in this scenario, 
you know, we've said it before, not every customer is a good customer. Um, we all get greedy at times, we all get fearful at times and wanna take every job that comes across our door, whether it has very large potential to go badly like this or not. This is a scenario where, you know, unless they were 80% of my business, which no customer should be, I consider either scaling back or looking at other options to doing so much work for this company because at some point it's gonna go, go blow back on you. You may pass the first three jobs for 200 parts, they order 10,000 and then they burn you on 10,000. These kind of things happen. It's, uh, it's not an if, it's a when you get burned. So that's my advice for that customer. For the other customer with the pin where they're not able to change the drawing, I've had this happen before too. Typically what I do and some other posters on the thread said as well, is I would make a document called a scope of work or a statement of work. So it's basically just a one page document and because the drawing cannot be changed, I would basically outline on that document saying, we're gonna change this to this, we're gonna change this to this, this is what the tolerance is gonna be, um, this is the price, I sign it, and then the customer signs it. So although the drawing is calling out one thing, essentially we're gonna staple a one page amendment on it that we both agree on, and you know it's a semi-legal document I guess, to make sure that we both agree what the part needs to be. That way, if you're in a scenario where the drawing can't be changed, you still have some backup to be able to go to. It's, it's the best thing to do. If they're not willing to do that, again, probably time to dial up sales. This is a scenario that's gonna burn you at some point. Um, you know, unfortunately, some companies can be great customers for a lot of years. They change ownership, they change purchasers, they change whatever. You're not gonna do work for them forever sometimes. So, you know, it's always good to have more customers in the pipeline to make sure when scenarios like this come up, you have backup. Um, the other thing I like to point out is that in scenarios like this, I know we all like to say that machining is a clinical and detached business and you know we make parts to whatever. At the end of the day, guys, it's a people business. If you're dealing with customers, every business is a people business. If in these scenarios, you're ruffling their feathers, so they send you a drawing and you get all mad and say, no, you don't understand, blah, blah, blah. You're gonna kill the relationship and no matter how good your parts are, if, unless you're the only game in town, they're gonna go somewhere else. It's important in these scenarios to make sure that you're being patient, you're being courteous, and you're treating people with respect. You can educate and correct people without being rude about it. And I think that's something that often gets lost in this business, so you should keep it in mind. In any case, guys, I'd like to know in the comments below, have you ever dealt with a scenario like this? where a customer doesn't follow their own tolerances or rejected parts, although they pass QA on your end. How did you deal with it? How did you get through it? I'd love to know in the comments below. As always, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Thank you very much for watching, guys. You take care.